begin, as seems appropriate, for a conference hosted by the Edmund Burke Foundation with an Edmund Burke quotation. Burke famously wrote in his Reflections on the Revolution in France, quote, the age of chivalry is gone, that of sophisters, economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. It was poignant when Burke wrote it, and an attempt to reconfigure that sentiment for our current malaise yields something approximating the following, quote, the age of quote unquote neutrality is gone. That of wokesters, oligarchs, and an arrogant ruling class has succeeded. And the quote unquote glory of the post war neoliberal order is extinguished forever. A distinct but related formulation, one that I have been known to use in my writings before, would be this President Ronald Reagan once famously said, quote, the most terrifying words in the English language are, quote, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But really, in the year 2021, we should be able to intuit that the new, quote, most terrifying words are, quote, I'm from the ruling class and I'm here to subjugate you. So let's step back and take a walk through the intellectual and political history and unpack this a little bit. Any relevance of claims to either universal truth or empirical generalizations notwithstanding, a political movement inherently arises in a specific time and place in order to address a set of concrete ad hoc challenges. The so-called, so -called, quote, modern conservative movement is of course no different, arising as it did in the early Cold War era to address the circumstantial challenges of a menacing Soviet Union abroad and an overly taxed polity at home. Oppressive communism's ascendance on the world stage, coupled with oppressive Eisenhower era marginal tax rates that reached as high as 91%, did indeed militate in favor of a nascent political movement that viewed liberty and freedom as preeminent organizing principles, at minimum, and potentially even preeminent substantive ends of governance greater than that. It is thus unsurprising that Frank Meyer, the progenitor of the so-called fusionism, still venerated today by Conservatism Inc., was a profoundly and fundamentally libertarian thinker. Meyer may have been personally culturally conservative, we've all heard this before, right? But to quote the Ethics and Public Policy Center's Henry Olson from this past June, Meyer's actual political agenda boiled down to, quote, freedom's domain is politics, virtue's domain is private life, unencumbered and unaided by support from public life. The result, Henry Olson rightly says, is that, quote, virtue shorn of any legitimate political claim upon freedom becomes freedom's handmaid. There is little room under this governing paradigm for a younger and considerably less libertarian George Will's notion of, quote, statecraft as soulcraft. The fusionism of conservatism, Inc., as a roadmap for governance, stifles well-intentioned statesmen from pursuing the actual art of politics itself. It is inherently a feat, limp, and as Hillsdale College's David Azarad, my good friend, might say, unmasculine. Let me say that again. The fusionism of conservatism, Inc., for the past half century plus, has shown itself to be effete, limp, and unmasculine. And it is, and it is effete, limp, and unmasculine because it removes from the political arena and consigns to the quote unquote private sphere the very value judgments and critical questions that most affect our humanity, our sovereignty, and our civilization. The defensive posture of liberalized fusionism, which ensures never having to face pushback from one's political opponents on the very most contested issues, makes for a cowardly approach to politics. It is also predicated in its entirety on the fundamentally and empirically false distinction between the quote unquote private and the quote unquote public. Conservatives intuit that this purported dichotomy is, as Yoram would of course tell us, liberal to its core. The post-war neoliberal inspired conservative movement also in crucial ways actually sowed the seeds of its very own destruction. Give credit where credit is due. So-called three-legged stool conservatism helped defeat the Soviet Union slash taxes and sustain at least reasonably, if not quite consistently high GDP growth. But in virtually every other way, it is difficult to see what claims to victory conservatism Inc. might plausibly make.
In perhaps no area is this more easily seen than my own area, as David alluded to, of greatest expertise, the Constitution and the courts. 39 years after the founding of the Federal Society and 48 years after Roe versus Wade itself, Roe remains on the books. The modern quote unquote conservative legal movement has peculiarly fetishized the secondary or perhaps even tertiary concern of administrative state demolition, perhaps conveniently forgetting that a greater guiding principle for an early generation, earlier generation of federal society luminaries was actually the overturning of destructive mid-century Warren Court era criminal procedure precedents that both liberals on the left and civil libertarians on the right both love. When Ed Meese was Ronald Reagan's attorney general, he is said to have once quipped that if he could overturn one case, it would be Miranda versus Arizona. You know, for those of you who watch Law and Order, that's your like Miranda rights case, your rights to remain silent. Good luck with that today. In fact, as a literally card-carrying Federal Society member and a popular Federal Society speaker myself, I don't think I've ever heard Miranda versus Arizona get mentioned at a Federal Society event. But in the year 2021, it is clear that the lingering effects of the post-war neoliberal-inspired conservative movement are actually worse than merely feckless. We can now soberly look back at what sailed under a quote-unquote movement conservative flag for the past half century and conclude that much of the project has been affirmatively counterproductive in retrospect, redounding against Americans' human flourishing and the pursuit of our common good. President Nixon's 1972 visit to Chairman Mao in Beijing ushered in an era of bipartisan lionization of quote unquote free trade with communist China. Ostensibly, we might be able to chalk this up to the foreign policy establishment's hubris and naivete that liberalized economic relations with China might ultimately lead to political liberalization for the repressed Chinese people. So it suffice it to say that hasn't exactly worked out as initially planned. On the contrary, the results have been positively disastrous. The offshoring of millions of jobs, the shuttering of thousands of factories across the American heartland, the hollowing out of America's industrial base, countless lives ruined by fentanyl, including on a very personal note, actually, my departed second cousin, the emboldening of our foremost geopolitical adversary, of course, and the grotesque reality where that, adver where that adversary, the Chinese Communist Party, can actually now hoard and keep us from accessing our, quote, personal protective equipment during a pandemic that very adversary inflicted upon the world. But uh, again, the problem is actually, I hate to be a, a, a doomsdayer here, it's actually even more, broader and more structural than even that. D decades of unfettered movement of goods, capital, and labor have torn asunder the very fabric and sinews of all of our most important institutions, the nation state, the church and the synagogue, and of course, the bedrock of all society, the family unit itself. We have an extremely attenuated sense of commonality and peoplehood, as well as the inter interdependent bonds of citizenship, without which no polity can long endure. All of that has drastically frayed. Even that favorite trope of kind of pro-federalism, Brandeisian laboratories of democracy quoting conservatives to, you know, go ahead and just vote with your feet. We've all heard this, right? I, I support that, and I've actually done that. I moved to, to Miami here in the great state of Ron DeSantis governed Florida a little over two months ago. But in, in the year 2021, that largely actually rings hollow. It's good to an extent, but it largely rings hollow. Because for better or for worse, we currently live under a national regime that has its fingers in an infinite number of state level inner workings. Value questions and the culture war unavoidably transpire, unavoidably transpire, transpire in large part on the national stage. To sacrifice the levers of power of the national government is to unilaterally disarm in the culture war. To go back to, to Demin Burke, Burke's conception also of a people as a concrete, quote, partnership of generations dead, living, and yet unborn is very difficult to reconcile with the fact that American immigration law remains governed by Ted Kennedy's beloved 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which of course has flooded multinational corporations with cheap labor at the expense of the concrete unity of citizenship that John Jay sagaciously saw as necessary for a flourishing republic all the way back in the Federalist number two. We are in the year 2021 an atomized, balkanized, and in many ways profoundly sad and despondent people. We need greater social consolidation, more meaning to our lives, and ultimately more God and more scripture. 
At the same time, of course, the woke left, having completed its march through the institutions, and by this point it really has completed it, is now a loud, blue-checked tail wagging the dog that is a decadent and sordid ruling class. The wokesters, the elites, and the intersectional multiculturalists are absolutely relentless in their assault on the very underpinnings of American citizenship and the American way of life. Crucially, their long institutional march has actually been partially abetted by neoliberal myopia. Republicans' decades-long fixation on corporate deregulation as an end to be pursued unto itself has helped collapse the aforementioned public-private distinction and abet the rise of a new socio-corporate tyranny. Woke capitalists rule the roost on Wall Street using engorged economic clout to fight the culture war with the aim of defeating their enemy. That's us. In Silicon Valley, monopolist robber barons who despise us but control the means of our 21st century public square nonetheless unduly benefit from neoliberal-inspired antitrust theorizing and case law advancing an overly narrow and constrained view of antitrust law's so-called consumer welfare standard. Again, between our sacrifice of the very art of politics itself and our obsession with neoliberal orthodoxy, we have sowed the seeds of our very own destruction. We have supplied the wokesters the very rope with which to hang ourselves. Conservatism Inc. has tried its best, to go back to Mr. Lincoln, to fulfill Abraham Lincoln's prophecy in his 1838 Lyceum Address where he said, quote, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. Conservatism Inc. has tried very hard to fulfill that prophecy. At this late hour, neoliberal platitudes are simply not going to save the American Republic. Values neutral proceduralism, such as exaltations of laissez-faire absolutism and legal positivism in constitutional law, will not save America now, not at this late hour. Corporate tax cuts, and other Wall Street Journal editorial board prescriptions simply are not going to cut it. We need a more muscular, assertive, and masculine vision of conservatism. We need a vision of conservatism that prioritizes not zombie free market idolatry, but a vigorous political agenda dedicated to quote a popular 2019 essay that I'm sure many of you have read, to quote, fighting the culture war with the aim of defeating the enemy and enjoying the spoils. The only way for the American right to accomplish this, once regaining power, is to prudentially wield that power in the service of pursuing our ideal of the substantive good and to affirmatively reward our friends and punish our enemies within the confines of the rule of law. That is what the left does, is what they've done for a century now. There's absolutely no reason that our approach should be any different whatsoever. Now, the ends that we seek into which the prudential exercise of that political power in the service of good political order must be directed can roughly be described as the substantive justice and the common good that constitute what I've referred to as the telos of the American regime. Those ends must necessarily entail the institutional solidification of the political sovereigns equipped to actually effectuate and achieve those ends, the bolstering of the bedrock societal unit, which is of course the family, and the defeat of cultural wokeism and restoration of cultural sanity by partial means of the return of overt public religiosity and the return of God to the public square. The, the American founding period's approach to God in the public square, we might be able to think of this, I think it was Chad Pecknold who tweeted this, we might be able to, to think of this as a, an ecumenical integralism of sorts. And I'd argue that national conservatism should adopt that and run with it. The means by which we seek these ends, of course, as well, also must be more pliable than the procedural rigidities long envisioned by the leading bastions of conservatism, Inc. As my good friend Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, put it in an April Substack post, quote, the stakes are high and the time to fight is now, wielding whatever levers of power are available. Ryan continued, quote, the right needs to think less dogmatically and more creatively about defending its friends and constituents and exchanging tit for tat. In the realm of tangible public policy, consider the example of big tech. The national conservative argument here, as at least I conceive it, is quite simple and straightforward. Digital life saps our humanity and undermines the common good. 
And the big tech robber barons are avowed enemies of our traditional values to boot. Therefore, rein them in and punish them using all available means within the confines of the rule of law, period. The analysis really need not be much more complicated than that. There are any number of examples for this. We can think about kind of higher education and how we should effectively, from my perspective, defund every penny from the taxpayer dime that goes to it. We can think about uh, J.D. Vance, who's speaking here tonight. J.D., uh, it was on Tucker Carlson's show, I believe, was in, in September. He talked about uh, uh, seizing the Ford Foundation's assets, and then J.D. kind of followed up on that in an op-ed that he wrote for me in Newsweek. It was a wonderful op-ed. And he basically says that the Ford Foundation is acting as a leftist political advocacy group and not a charity, then tax them like that. There's absolutely no reason they should not be like taxed to the hilt. So this is the very prudential and reasonable, I would argue, manipulations of the levers of power that we should feel very comfortable wielding. And in, in the arena of jurisprudence and the judiciary, as David Brog alluded to, I propose my own more methodologically and substantively conservative strand of constitutional interpretation that I have called common good originalism. Common good originalism overtly and unapologetically places its interpretive thumb on the scale of the telos and the overarching substantive orientation of the American regime and the American way of life. American national conservatism prioritizes the national interest and sovereign independence of the American nation state on the world stage and the common good of the American polity on the domestic front. In the case of the latter, as a matter of both domestic politics and constitutional jurisprudence, the common good must prevail when it conflicts with either radical conceptions of individual autonomy inconsistent with traditional American customs and substantive human flourishing on the one hand, such as the transgender phenomenon, or poisonous multiculturalism threatening to further divide an already divided citizenry on the other hand, such as critical race theory, of course. Absolutist, doctrinal, ideological, constitutional claims such as the notion that the First Amendment pur pur purportedly protects critical race theory indoctrination in the classroom should be flatly rejected. They should not stand a chance. The silver lining of the ultimate failures of this post-war neoliberal inspired conservative movement is that those failures have laid bare for all to see the misbegotten notion that the public square, as Michael Nose spoke about just a few minutes ago, and by extension, institutions such as the free market and constitutional interpretation itself can ever be values neutral. That is a lie. They cannot ever be values neutral, period. The wokesters, oligarchs, and our arrogant ruling class obviously intuit this, and they act firmly and unapologetically upon it. Surely it is not too much to ask that a conservatism worthy of the name do the same. A renewed and self-aware self conservatism, again, must get comfortable wielding power, wielding power to reconsolidate a fractured citizenry, bolster the nuclear family, place meaningful guardrails on the excesses of purist laissez-faire that are destructive to the common good, and punish the wokesters and multiculturalists for their pernicious agenda, tearing the country apart. Ultimately, every important political issue in the year 2021 is, of course, a cultural issue. Fusionism and libertarianism will never, ever, ever suffice to take on those challenges. Only a muscular national conservatism can suffice. Thank you very much.